cooking spaghetti on the stove because our friend Arnold is with us for the weekend. Arnold, how come you're here for the weekend? Oh, Mr. and Mrs. Zeebel have gone on their second honeymoon. They're so much in love. Wait, Arnold, you're in love too? With the basket hound? Oh, I'm so happy for you. We'll have to have him over for dinner and I'll make some more spaghetti for him. Are you hungry? You getting hungry now? Oh, I need to get out and get the spaghetti. Here you go. Some spaghetti for you. Do you like it? Do you like the spaghetti? You think the spaghetti is so good? I should feed it for my own family? Then maybe I will do that. I will make spaghetti and let it cook while we're doing the show. There. Spaghetti will be ready when the show is over. Welcome everybody to Living Figuratively. This is the 27th episode with your host, Judy Takas. Um, tonight's special episode, actually Living Figuratively, is the show that asks the question, why not fill your home with the fabulous faces and figures of people that you don't even know? Why not fill your home with figurative art? Each week, I take you to a different room in my house and show you work from my collection or my own work and basically tell you how you can love with and live with figurative art. Tonight, tonight's episode is called What's Cooking? Art in the Kitchen. And there's no reason why you can't have art in the kitchen. And as the episode continues, you'll find out why I love having art in the kitchen and why it's so special to me. I'm gonna kick it off with this little beauty here by the artist Kathy Rogers. Kathy Rogers is, has, holds a very special place in my heart. She is a fantastic person who I met at the Portrait Society many, many years ago. Um, she also has posed for Chicks with Balls, and here is her Chicks portrait in the Purple Book. I, Kathy posed with seven partially deflated beach balls, which stands for, you know, symbolized all the people in her life that she cares for that need her like the air they breathe. Um, so Kathy holds a really special place in my heart. Um, once upon a time, when Kathy came to pose for her chick's portrait, she, at the same time, she asked me if I would pose for some photos for her so that she could do a portrait of me. So I said, of course. Uh, she actually ended up doing this really big, beautiful, glamorous portrait of me called Lady Pendergast, which ended up going to the uh, Lakeland Woman Show at the time, curated by Mary Urbis at the Lakeland Community College. And um, when she was doing that portrait, she also did a bunch of studies, or maybe she only did one. I'm not sure how many studies she had, but this is the one that ended up in my collection. And I think she just got a gorgeous likeness of me. Um, from this was maybe six, seven years ago. It's, you know, having an, a great artist as a great friend, it's a really good way to get a portrait that has a nice likeness of you. It's always hard to do a self-portrait with a good likeness because I think you just know too much about yourself. And also when you're doing the self-portrait, your expression is changing all the time depending on how well the portrait is going or how worried you are about how the portrait is going or, you know, all that. But when you have a good friend that sees you but maybe doesn't know every single thing about you and can put it together like this, I, I just love this. So that's why I hung it in my kitchen so that I can see it every day because the kitchen really is the hearth and the heart of the family. That's where... All your people that you love are like, every day, or you know, at least as long as they're they're living with you and they're at home. That's where you know the husbands and the kids. That's where the neighbor pigs and the basket hounds all you know congregate in the uh, the uh, heart of the home, which is the kitchen. 
Um, this portrait also was small enough and beautifully framed where I could actually do a little wall full of small with these technical things that, you know, you don't, you don't love them, but you kind of need them as part of your normal life. This right here is a uh, intercom system. This one is um, a housewide music system. And here's a bunch of light switches. And, you know, our homes have to have these things on. So I call them what they are and I coordinate things to go with them in, as a wall full of small instead of, you know, just like pretending like they don't exist. Occasionally though, I've done a smart thing where if there's something that doesn't get used very much, I'll actually hang a painting over it so that I can just kind of lift up the painting and deal with the controls if it's only very occasionally. Um, moving up the wall is one of my paintings that is the sister painting to one of my favorite best paintings I've ever done kind of paintings. Her sister, the sister painting sold years ago at the Women Painting Women exhibition at the um, Charleston Gallery, uh, the principal gallery in Charleston, South Carolina. So all I have left of her is the catalog picture of the painting that sold already. But her, if just in case the, the, um, the collector that bought this, because I'm not sure where she ended up, just in case the collector that bought this uh, is watching, her sister is available. Though so I love having her, so I'm very happy to keep her. So anyway, now I'm gonna tell you, maybe you can guess how come I like to hang art in the kitchen. This is where I sit. Oh, I love this, the spaghetti's here. <laughs> this is where I sit in the kitchen when we have our, when we have our meals. And when I'm sitting in the kitchen over here, this is what I see. I see some of my favorite pieces of art. And I love being able to look over there when I'm having my meal. So I'm gonna, since this is a little bit of a decorating show and art show, we're gonna start over here in this corner and I'm gonna show you this piece of furniture first. Um, we, our family that lives with books, loves books, has lots of books, like way more books than we can ever read, which is a good way to be. And I don't decorate with books, um, but I love, having them places, and so I love having them in things and, you know, like where you can see that there's a lot of books here. So I found this gorgeous cabinet years ago, and I think it was from the Wisteria catalog, and um, I ordered it because red is kind of a color that figures large in my house, in my life, in my art. So when I find red things that are painted beautifully and, you know, hand-painted and fun like that, I will, um, you know, try to fit them into my life. So we've got this beautiful bookcase. Up on top of it, not to waste any space, I've got a little bit of curated clutter up there and it's all kinds of things. I've got red candles, I've got a little, a little house with some pictures of my boys in it, I've got wax nubbins, I've got pictures, pictures, not pictures. I've got spools, these, you know, antique spools that used to be in like antique mills and things. And my gavel right here, which years ago I found this at an antique store and um, I only just used it for the first time last week when I did the Ruth Bader Ginsburg tribute as part of Living Figuratively. So I'm glad that I had that. And I'll put it back up in its honorary space. Um, on either side of the bookshelf, I have different levels of height. Over here, I've got this curly willow in I think this is like a butter churn or a once a piece of a butter churn, also antique store thing. The curly willow kind of makes a segue to the outside, like the outside is just beyond, so you know, it kind of makes sense and it gives a little bit of a height here. Then down here, I've got this funky little, I'm scared to sit on it chair. I'm not sure who could sit on this, maybe a little child, but even a, a little child would have to be not too unstable because I'd be scared if the, the child was too small that they might fall off the chair because it's three-legged and weird. 
but I saw this at an antique store and just fell in love with it. It's just, you know, it's one of those things, I don't know how much it was, like $25, $30 or something like that. And I just thought, I want, I'm gonna make a place for this in my life. And right now, this is the place for it in my life. And at one point I was thinking I might paint it red, but I think, you know, the salmon, it was part of the, the color that it came with. So I'm gonna leave it salmon until the mood really takes me and like, okay, now I gotta paint it red. Okay. Now, let's move to the, the wall of art. This is a little bit of a wall full of small that I have here. Every kitchen needs a clock. And we have this nice big steampunk clock with pretend gears. The gears actually used to move, but they were making these, this weird squeaky noise all the time. And when we figured out that the gears were the ones that were making this squeaky noise, we pulled out the battery from the gears. So now the gears are just pretty to look at but the hands of the clock still move. I think we even had to replace the hands because the hands were too little, but the clock was so cool, it was worth all the trouble. So the clock is kind of the centerpiece for this wall full of small. It kind of creates like a, I want to say the golden ratio type thing where you've got this, this spiral, it's sort of the eye of the tornado for the wall full of small. And while we're doing the tornado, we'll just start over on this side. Um, the very first piece that I want to talk about here is by Nicholas Uribe. This is a beautiful, beautiful drawing of his that, um, it's a sketchbook drawing actually, it came from one of his sketchbooks. And one of the things I loved about it was that he is able to achieve such depth using these very unusual drawing colors. It's magenta and green. So like it was a magenta pencil and a green pencil. And he's able to just achieve depth and realism and, and super character and expression, expression. And when I say realism, this is not a realistic looking portrait, but it's real. You know what I mean? Hopefully you do. Um, I love the way her her mouth is. It's It just has that human, Maybe I'm thinking, maybe this is the way my mouth is. Maybe I'm in the middle of talking. It just has like a real human feel to it. And uh, because this was a drawing on paper, I took it to my favorite framer, Susie Porges Studio, um, and we picked out this beautiful magenta mat for it. Um, and then this kind of goth frame, because I could see this girl, you know, being a little, you know, maybe a goth teenager type person. I don't know. I don't know anything about her, but I think she's fascinating and I would love to know more about her. Now, the way that I got this portrait, because his stuff sells out immediately. Like, it, you look on his website and it's all sold, 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 sold. So, like, his stuff is hard to get, but I was not asleep at the wheel when he put out on Facebook that he was having a GoFundMe. So, he was having a GoFundMe to create a... Um, a to scale model book reproduction of one of his absolutely fabulous sketchbooks, his moleskin sketchbooks, which are very small. So I signed up for the GoFundMe and this is the beautiful sketchbook reproduction that I got, which he just has like, he, he, Paints the, this is how he painted on his sketchbook, you know, like overlapping the top page and the bottom page. And I can only assume he's got oil paintings on the back of oil paintings. So the real sketchbook, it, it has to stay intact because if you frame any of these, you're losing one for every one you frame. Um, but it's just a stunning, stunning, stunning book. And when I signed up for the GoFundMe, he had different levels. One of the levels was where you get a actual drawing from an actual sketchbook. This, this one came from a different sketchbook because I didn't find it in the book because I think he didn't tear this apart and frame them. But presumably he's got other drawings that, um, that are loose. And I didn't know which drawing I was gonna get. I didn't know what it was gonna look like, but I knew I was gonna love it. And, but I didn't expect that I was gonna love it this much. I was just absolutely thrilled when this drawing was included in my package with the, with the sketchbook. So my advice to those of you who ever see an artist go fund me, go fund them.
sign up for a good level because you get good stuff and it's really worth it. And it helps the artist um, achieve a larger goal, which is expensive to like do a, a, a book. It's you know, a very expensive thing, especially if you don't know if people are gonna buy it. So it's nice to have some pre-sales. Anyway, moving along over here, this is a portrait by Jeffrey Hine, who uh, this portrait actually was a demo at the Portrait Society um, a bunch of years ago. And I've watched Jeffrey Hine demo many times publicly on, this, on the Portrait Society stage and also as part of the face-off, which this, this portrait was part of the face-off, where it's like a competitive thing where 20 different artists paint probably 10 different models and um, at the end, you uh, the pieces get auctioned off and they're, you know, beautiful. Um, one of the things I love about Jeffrey Hines' work, he is, he, it's like these beautiful expressive brush strokes, wonderful use of color. It's really a beautiful example for me and a lot of inspiration. So I love staring across the table at this beauty. Um, Jeffrey Hines has a atelier in Utah and one of his principles or one of his lines in the sand that he, you know, his rules is he has made a commitment to only paint from life. He, will, he does not paint from photography. He only paints from life. That's his commitment. So like, for instance, if he needs a donkey in his paintings, because he does a lot of religious paintings and back in biblical times, there were lots of donkeys, uh, <laughs> I guess, he will actually build a little statue, like a maquette, a... Um, a clay statue of a donkey and then he'll put a light on it to light it the way that it looks good for his painting and then he will paint his his homemade donkey into the painting and the you know the statue donkeys hold still unlike a real donkey that wouldn't hold still so he's made that commitment to painting from life um, many artists many artists do that like they have their line in the sand where they consider this to be you know part of my integrity and this other thing to be not part of the integrity of my work. Um, like for instance, me, I will paint from photography, but I will only paint from my own photography. So I have to have taken the photo myself and it has to be directly um, made for reference for a painting. So that's, that's my philosophy. I have not built donkeys yet to put into my paintings, but maybe if I do, I will. I don't know. Um, though I probably would just go to find a donkey farm and take some pictures. In fact, I have a friend who has a donkey farm, so that's probably what I would do. Um, speaking of lines in the sand, let's move along over here to Daniel Sprick's gorgeous drawing here. This one was also a Portrait Society demo one year when I um, also bid on this against somebody that I subsequently made really good friends with, but at the time I was, you know, I was like, no, that's gonna be mine. So um, I watched him do the whole thing and I watched him do just these amazing skinny little lines with the um, vine charcoal. He just had this delicate little scrapey touch to them and then the solidity of the head and then just these beautiful veins in there, you know, and the, and the way that the light kind of recedes downwards into his face and just how chunky the, the lips and the cheek and everything are. It, it was really that he could do this in charcoal just, you know, just floored me. So I really had to make this, this portrait my own. Um, oh, speaking of lines in the sand, at that same uh, Portrait Society conference, uh, Daniel Sprick, gave a talk and one of the questions that uh, people asked him was do you ever transfer grid or project when you do your portraits and his answer was no no and hell no and I thought that was kind of an interesting answer and I'll explain what transfer gridding and projecting is for those of you who are not artists and don't know what that is um, transferring is where you might take a photograph that you want to do a painting from, and instead of looking at the photograph and painting from it side by side, you will actually use an artist's version of carbon paper and put it on the back of the photograph, put it onto your, the surface that you're gonna be painting on, 
and then trace around every little line and squiggle and every little shape on the portrait, on the photograph. So then you pick up the photograph and then you end up with something that looks a little bit like a paint by number um, kind of a drawing. And from that, you start filling in the colors and you do your, your painting on there. You can, get, it's, you can get some amazingly good results if you're good at it. It doesn't make it easy. It just makes it, I don't know, maybe a little bit more doable, but it's really difficult to get amazing results that way. So I'm not trying to take anything away from them by saying, oh, they trace it because that's just the first layer. But anyway, that's transferring. And I personally do not transfer in my art because it doesn't go the way my, the, it's not the way that I think or paint. Um, gridding is another way of transferring where you might draw a grid on your photograph where it's, you know, like one inch squares. And then you draw the same grid, scaled up or not, on your surface that you're gonna do your painting on. And then you go through and you copy the lines from each little square, which it just makes it more manageable. So like in this little square, there might just be one finger of your portrait. So all you have to do is copy one finger and the, the little lines around the nail bed and the little lines around how all the lights and stuff on that finger. So that's gridding. And that's also something I don't do on my portraits because it doesn't go with how I do it. And then the third one that he said hell no to is the projecting. So projecting is not in the psychological sense of projecting, where you project your, you know, whatever goals on, on somebody else. Um, projecting is where you take an artist's version of an overhead projector, if you remember those from elementary school, and, um, and take your photograph and project it onto the surface that you're going to paint on. And then you do your preliminary drawing that way and maybe the projecting people also do their painting with the projection going I don't know I, I don't project either so I don't even know how to do it um, but so he said no no and hell no to all three of those transfer transferring methods he basically draws it he looks at what what he wants to draw and he does use photo reference but some you know often does it from life like this one was done from life and draws it onto the um, onto the canvas, and that it, that goes along with what I do too. Because my method of painting, for me, if I went and painstakingly drew every little squiggle um, onto my uh, onto my canvas, it would really only be the first drawing I do. Because for me, the process of painting is redrawing something hundreds and hundreds of times over on top of each other. So. You know, it, it, all of that would be covered and it's a lot of work to do all that transferring. So that's why it, it doesn't fit into my particular art, art world. But different people have different lines in the sand and they will defend it very vehemently. Many people hide their process because they don't want people to know that they've done this thing that is sometimes perceived as cheating. So, but that's all up to, you know, every individual, every individual artist, how they how they do it and what they do. Um, so on this wall, okay, one of the things I have up there, super high, is this Hungarian, mysterious Hungarian artist. It looks like a guy in Hungarian native dress. And that was a painting that had been kicking around my house uh, growing up. I don't know who the painter is. I don't know even where it actually came from. And I should have asked my mom where it came from, but that ship has sailed and the mystery of where that portrait came from has, is gone with her. But I love it. I put him in a beautiful copper frame because I love the copper lights on him. And um, it you know, holds that nice honorable, honorable spot. And then I have paintings of my, my three boys in different, different ways. My oldest, my middle, and this one of Mark when he posed for Bay Arts um, for their uh, uh, portrait class one time and um, I did this painting on copper from, from life for him. And because they're small and also because it kind of goes with the tornado, I've got more wall controls here that are just kind of worked into the rectangle palooza that I have going on. Now, 
For the pièce de résistance, this painting right here, I'm going to say it is, I, I don't like to play favorites, but this is definitely in my top, top, top favorite um, painting that I own. This one is called Huntsman and Herdsman by Catherine Stone. And um, years ago, she posted this painting on Facebook and I just, I was just floored and fell in love with it immediately. When I found out that it, from her that it was going to be in a show that she was ha that she was a three artist show that she was having um, with Teresa Ohaka and David Gluck, I made a point of it to contact the gallery and I did a pre-sell. Galleries love doing pre-sells. If you know that something's going to be in a show, you don't have to wait. They will they will sell it to you, pre-sell it to you, and then at the opening. It has a red dot on it already. They love that because what it does is it makes other people kind of get in the buying mood. Like, ooh, if I don't buy this other one right away, it's going to get sold. So you're, you're doing great things for the gallery. You're doing great things for the artist because it shows that that artist is very popular to the gallery. So it's all good. Um, but none of it is as good as this painting, which I just, just, just loved. Um, one of the things that I love about this painting, I love the roundness of his head. I love it's, how it's done. I love the strawberry blonde of his hair. I love the strawberry blonde of the kitty. I love his belly. I love his Audi. I love his little, little hands there. And now some people might say, oh, how cute. It's a, it's a little boy with a little kitty because what could be more cute than a little boy with a little kitty? And yes, it's, it is or can be perceived as cute, and people have said that. I look at it as more like an old soul kind of a thing. It's an old soul that's also a young soul. And the, the whole hunting, hunter and herdsman, the hunter is the cat, and the herdsman is the little boy. And it brings up the metaphor of herding cats, which is obviously something nobody can do, that's just things out of control. Um, and you, you get the feeling he's just gripping for dear life to this little kitty and wants this little kitty to stay just a few seconds longer because the kitty's going to squirm out pretty darn soon. The kitty is kind of like, Aah. and, um, it just, it has this old world feel to it also. Like it could have been done 300 years ago. It could also have been done in 2014, which is, I believe when it actually was done. And um, it's just, just a stunning, stunning portrait. And I'm not the only one that thought so, though. Um, in 2015, Daniel Maidman wrote an article for HuffPost and um, all about just this one piece. He actually called it the Single Work Appreciation Day, Huntsman and Herdsman by Catherine Stone. So he wrote this whole article about one painting that he had never actually seen in person, I believe, because it was already in my possession, and it only hung at the show for like a few weeks, and then they sent it to me because, you know, there was a waiting customer for it. Um, he wrote, you can look it up on, you know, Google, uh, Daniel Maidman, HuffPost, Huntsman and Herdsman, if you want to read the whole article. I printed it out, and it's in my provenance file. But he kind of summed it up really nicely with this one statement here. He said, this is not a painting of a little boy and a kitten. It is a painting of you and of me and of everything we hold dear. He really, he, he has put together this really beautiful, large philosophy of why this painting is so important and symbolic of, of things. And um, it's, it's just a joy to read. So, and it also makes me feel good that I jumped on this painting and uh, ended up with it in my collection and that I get to sit every day and eat my spaghetti and look at this painting directly. So, thank you. I think that's it for tonight. We're stopping here in the kitchen. Once we round this corner, we're in the uh, family room and that's for another day, another episode. But thank you for joining me tonight for Living Figuratively. Be sure to come back next week. Next week, we are going to take a virtual trip to the, to Wisconsin, to the Wausau Museum of Contemporary Art for the Painting the Figure Now 
2020 show. I have one piece in that show, and my show, my living figuratively show, is going to be the pregame chatter about my show strategy when I entered the show, what I was thinking when I entered what I entered, why I didn't enter what I wanted to enter, and what got rejected. So you'll get to see all that next week, same bad time, same bad channel, and maybe by now the spaghetti's all ready, and um, I will see you next week, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Thursday night, October 8th. Y'all come back now, you hear?